you know, center. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Great Siegel Theater Center, at least we'd like to think it's that way, uh, at the Graduate Center CUNY in the middle and midtown in Manhattan. And uh, the church bells are ringing. It means it's 12 noon and it's a uh, Siegel um, talk time. And uh, it's a restart for us um, for this season. We um, decided after having so many uh, uh, Siegel talks, close to 200 with theater artists, we now uh, focus on two, two new um, uh, fields. One will be um, uh, writers who wrote books, finished books in the time of Corona. Many of them actually Siegel Talk participants. We talked about their work in our individual sessions and we said we'll come back when the book is finished or close to be finished. Uh, we have that and we're preparing our uh, film or screen festival for 2022, where we're now going to ask all around the world um, to see what it really was of interest. Uh, did it work? Uh, was there something that happened we should know about in other places? Is there something meaningful? Um, so um, today we do have with us the, the wonderful and great and much admired Bonnie uh, Maranka from PAJ, a Journal of Performance and Art. And it is the very, very beginning um, of our uh, series. It's Thanksgiving week here um, in America for all of our international listeners. We have listeners from over 20, 25 countries most of the time. And um, it's a significant week, the greatest and biggest holiday in uh, North America, really where everybody comes together uh, to see the families and friends um, in, um, in, in, a, in a setting that celebrates uh, life and art, family and, and community. And we are celebrating, I think, uh, for good reasons, uh, writers, books, I think it's of importance. Many of us went back to reading in the time of Corona. Many of us couldn't really read because they were blocked or they watched too many TV series um, and slowly get back day by day with, back into reading. But it has been an important um, um, part of what we did. So today we have us Bonnie and she's going to talk about her book timelines, writings and conversations. And um, at the end of November, we have Teresa Smalek. He will talk about her book on Ron Water, the great actor from the Wooster group, started out uh, with the performance group. And, um, and, uh, and he is uh, uh, much uh, missed in the uh, New York community. He was made a significant contribution. We're gonna have Emily Mann with us and Alexis Green, who took many years to write a book. Emily Mann, rebel artist, of the American theater in the US, Kari Perloff will talk about Pinter and Stoppard, a director's view and really look into the work um, of these uh, two uh, major significant contemporary British writers. And I think it's also a time for us to look back at plays and connect to them. We're gonna have uh, uh, Anne Catania with us who wrote The Art of Dramaturgy, a significant book. Many consider her as America's foremost uh, dramaturg as well from the time she has worked and her experience, I think it is unmatched um, um, what we have as a literary uh, dramaturg. And Bogart um, is finishing, or is close to finishing her book. I think it's going to go to print soon, The Art of Resonance, the idea of what does resonate and should we consider that term um, for um, the theater. So she will um, be with us. And then after Siri de Lupulu with uh, Frank Rabatz, Rabatz from Germany, she's from Greece, who also was with us. She is uh, talking to us for a very interesting project. Over 20 writers and artists got together and talk about staging 21st century tragedies, theater politics, and the global crisis. And Aiko, the great Aiko the dancer, um, from uh, born and raised in Japan, living in New York, will talk about her book, A Body in Fukushima, her little essays, not a little, her, her, her essays and reflections um, with uh, performance photos. So um, I think it will be an interesting uh, lineup, and I hope um, that it will also be meaningful for all of you who are listening. You can go if you got the email invitation and click uh, on the Google Drive. Um, all of the writers gave a chapter on introduction to the books for free. So you can follow it, read it. And I hope you will decide to go to your local bookstore and, um, and order the books and, um, and perhaps take some time to, to, um, to read them. So um, here we go, Bonnie, where are you and how are you? <laughs> I'm here in New York City. I'm fine. Thank you. Very nice to to be here. I, it's not often that one gets to talk about books and the places for reviews and all that are, are less and less uh, available, you know, yeah. for serious And you are in Soho, right? Uh, Soho, yeah. In, at uh, Charlton Sixth Avenue, um, which is, has been your, your artistic home in New York City, next to your Hudson upstate. 
yes. uh, place. Yep. So for all of you who do not know, and I'm sure many uh, uh, um, listeners have heard about her, but might not really be able to place her. So Bonnie Maranka is the founding publisher and editor of the OB award-winning PAJ publications, a journal of performance and art. It started out as a journal of performance, and it's also a journal of performance and art. She's a recipient of the Association for Theater and Higher Education Excellence in Editing Award. And we're gonna talk about editing today what it means and, um, and for sustained achievement. And she's the author of Performance Histories, Ecologies of Theater, Theater Writings, for which she got the George Nason uh, um, Award for Dramatic Criticism. And she um, just finished her work at the um, New School, where she was a professor of theater at the Eugene Lang College um, of Liberal Arts. And Bonnie um, took the time uh, of Corona, as we say it, to look back at 12 years of, of writing of essays, uh, introductions to a great journal that comes out periodically and throughout the year, um, like uh, the Super Bowls and uh, the World Cups, and you can see in those baseball seasons, the uh, PAJ magazine comes in our mail. And it is next to TDR, I think, uh, the significant uh, really uh, archive and uh, recording of uh, performance history and also theater history and she has helped to actually also shape the history of performance and with a great sense of responsibility. And she does ask, why is one piece more important than another? And that she really is looking for new ways and new forms of essays and critical writings and focuses on that. And she reflects on the ideas of our time and how it shaped artwork. So um, I'm going to just show the book. And it's also that beautiful, um, beautiful, beautiful cover. Um, so Bonnie, um, how does it feel to have the book out? Uh, I guess no book tour. <laughs> um, I've actually never gone on a book tour. <laughs> um, I'm just happy to have the books out. Uh, you know, this book is 12, the last 12 years of my uh, work, um, um, much of my writings and a number of the uh, artist interviews. So I'm, I'm glad to, you know, move on after that and uh, that, I, that I have the work uh, out and together. And I, I more or less organize it uh, in, around two, 2019. And, uh, you know, I've been working on it then because I had to write many different sections of it, the introductions the preface, a lot of the research material and, uh, and all the copy editing and everything, I had put it aside. And then during the, during the pandemic, I, I uh, had worked on the conversations with Meredith Monk, which we did an expanded edition of, and then I turned to my book so, um, and worked straight through. So it just came out in, uh, in the summer, actually. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I feel good about the, about the, the book and the work and uh but um you know now it's done and it's out and so is solitude good for Other writing and for writing yeah. and editing pardon is solitude good for writing and editing oh well you, you need that uh, i did the i worked on the book partly in new york um in 2020 and then partly upstate the preface was written between uh, up, uh hudson valley and also new york but def definitely as a you know, as a, as a writer and also editor, you need a lot of time alone. Uh, it, it, it's, it's time alone. Uh, um, solitude may be another category, but I'm not the type of writer who needs to close myself off for days and work day and night. I get a lot of energy by, you know, t taking a walk or being with people, or I'm easily interrupted if somebody calls to go out. I'm, I'm not a kind of a obsessive writer that's glued to my desk. I don't have a plan every mm -hmm. day to write or anything. It's not like that. Um, you know, so yeah. work on my so you write in the description. So we give our audience a little um, uh, uh, feel for it. Um, you turn to far ranging subjects that include catastrophic imagination, landscape and writing, performance drawing, cultural history, and the issues of emotion, beauty, and the spiritual in art and her perspectives, your perspectives on performance, visual arts, media, and drama, and the work of 
so so many great artists Joan Jonas, Carol Churchill, Raymond Holger, John Jesseron, Dick Higgins, Meredith Monk, Schneemann, Shepard, Forness, uh, list um, goes on and on. There's a, a beautiful quote which I like. You said, um, "The editor is invisible ink, like a figure in the carpet. The editor remains in the published journal, in its relationship with artists, in its authors, in its worldviews, in its history." in what is not. Tell me a bit about it, What in what is not. Uh, that piece is called Remaining Paragraphs. I was asked to contribute to the Contemporary Theater Review, uh, one of their anniversaries, and I wrote uh, a, a piece about editing. So the passage you read, it, it, it comes at the end of the, of the uh, essay, which is rather short, and I and it was really talking about all the work that needs to be that needs to go into um, uh, copy editing and corrections and permissions and getting photographs and doing things over and over and over again. And I guess I was reflecting on um, where the editor is in a journal. Um, one one could say it's in the it's in the adverbs or you know it's in the dashes or something like that and i and i and i guess i was thinking about um the role it may not always be apparent to people who are reading a journal um what an editorial profile is or they may not think about that but you know years ago when people used to read a journal from start to finish mm -hmm. um one would have planned like how the journal opens and what you go to next and then next and how, what things fit together. Unfortunately, those days are gone because mostly journals are read online and people don't read all, all the issues anymore. They read in a very specialized way, which is very um, a, a lesser experience in my view to just read what pertains to your research um, rather than something start to finish. Um, yeah even if it's over time. It's so, uh, so there's, there, you know, an, an editor always has to focus on an issue. What is the balance? What, are there too much about one country or one type of art? Do we have enough about, um, you know, theater or dance or performance or music or things like that or interviews? Um, so the editor's hand is always is always and the, and the staff, the editorial, the editorial staff is always thinking about what to cover. Um, you're always working on one issue that's maybe at press, and you're on the next one already, as we are already working on the spring issue. Um, so I I was playing around with these ideas of uh, of the of the deep. Um, place of, of the, uh, the editorial profile that's not always in, uh, apparent, that may not be visible, but it's, it's between the lines or it, you know, it's, it's, um, it's in the margins. It's, it's, it's always there because you have to decide what, you know, how you're going to cover something, who's going to do it, what things need to be covered. You don't always reach your goals. It's always a kind of utopian, um, uh, um, uh, process mm -hmm. because you're always striving to find things and it's not always possible to find the writers or people who've seen something or to get coverage especially if you don't have a staff all over the world so it's a it's a very um it's a very dynamic process and it's part of a kind of slow philosophy that i have too a journal is a slow technology it's not like a blog or something that you know people write comments overnight or, or something immediately on the spot. Journals have reflective pieces and um, bec because they only come out three times a year. So it gives time for reflection on, on something. So it, in that way, it's a slow philosophy. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think you wrote, yeah, you said a journal is a more traditional technology whose form is purposefully designed as a place to set down well-considered thoughts in unhurried sentences that open to fields of paragraphs. And, um, and I think it is really um, something that makes also PAJ different, the literary um, and the quality, I think, um, in, of the essays. Um, 
and um, and um, and of the work. And I mean, you said, you know, I've always written out of the love for writing. You know, one um, one can feel that. I feel the book is a bit like Adrian Kennedy's uh, biography in a way. Her, her, um, vignettes or little uh, islands in archipelagos when she wrote uh, people who led me to my place it could be uh, bonnie uh, maranka's artist who led me to my essays you know it's a, a reflection or sometimes they're longer sometimes they're shorter sometimes it's a page and a half sometimes it is uh, 10 pages it's really uh, an archipelagos that you um, um created um, and um and the names um, you all mentioned of course are all leaders in our field, most of them, all of them, in a way you know um, uh, personally. So it is quite, uh, quite um, an ins significant and in important uh, um, memory. You said it's a mental space, and what we need, and we need to have that, and to have peace to allow dreams and thoughts come um, into your mind. So um, I think you, uh, in a way, write um, in a much more personal way in a much observative way so it is um, in a way different from performance studies and uh, you actually once said I see my work as an alternative uh, to performance studies or PAJ also so what what do you, do you mean by that well uh, performance studies uh, first of all it is, does not focus very much on on it on the text it's, it's performance oriented um, and oriented more toward the culture and also oriented toward the philosophy that anything is a performance. I've never held that point of view. Uh, I don't think that everything is performance and I've, I've felt that way for decades. Um, uh, PAJ, uh, along with uh, Tom Sellers uh, publication and his staff, the uh, Yale theater publication, um, are pretty much the only two that um, consistently publish plays. I don't recall if Tom publishes a play in every issue as a matter of format, but we do. As a writer, I'm extremely interested in writing. Performance art took, I mean, performance studies took off uh, 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 in a way uh, uh, much further um, di diverted than uh, Richard Schechter's broad spectrum theory um, because it became very theoretical and very much tied to cultural issues and um, current theories. The PAJ has never been theory-based. It's always been um, uh, a journal devoted to the primacy of the artwork and the critic's mm -hmm. voice. And it's not based on applied theory. Um, so I'm, I've always been very interested in my own work and experimenting with different critical forms. I, I started that at least by the early 80s. Um, and I you know, tried to seek out experimental uh, texts. Uh, I realized that the word experimental is also kind of a strange word to use now. It's not a period of experimentation, though there are texts that are not, let's say non-mainstream texts. I tried to seek out writers that um, that should be known or known better, or their texts are very interesting, their plays. Um, we've published maybe 1,200 plays by now from, you know, almost two dozen languages. So I, I'm seeking these from around the world. Um, we, we, um, we publish a lot of work in translation. Uh, it's always been that way. So uh, it, it diverts from performance studies in the sense that our main focus is not the study of performance. And it's very confusing now for people because some people use the term theater, some use performance. I mean, in a way, the PAJ is a theater journal, even though from the very beginning before people became much, much obsessed with talking about interdisciplinarity, we always dealt with performance, art, music and opera and dance and installations and video. And we had at the late, in the late seventies for eight issues that we published until the early eighties, another magazine called Live, which was really a kind of a zine, you could say, devoted mm -hmm. to performance. And it covered more of the clubs and um, a, a lot more of the downtown scene than we could fit in the journal. Then the journal gradually opened up more and more and we began to include more from the visual arts world. And then we no longer needed that other publication. Um, so we've always covered performance, but I always say P PAJ is a theater journal. It's not a performance studies journal. Sometimes people don't realize the, the difference between our journal and 
something more devoted to performance studies, just like, um, you know, the uh, Richard Goff's journal Performance Research, which is which is more of a performance studies journal. Um, yeah. we're, we're more akin to the Yale um, theater uh, journal because we we publish work that that the writing is very different. It's more literary and less mm -hmm. academic and theory based, let's say. You insist and you say there's a distinction between criticism and writing. Uh, yeah, uh, that in a way, it, the distinctions are changed now because now you could say there's a difference between uh, arts writing and academic writing because there's so little criticism. People don't really do criticism in the sense that say Harold Korman, you mentioned Harold Korman, or someone like Stanley Kaufman, or some of the older generation like Bruce Steen and um, uh, Daniel Gerald, Hilton, Andre Verity, Gerald, or, you know, someone. Uh, Hilton, Hilton Alls writes criticism in the New Yorker. Joan Acuchella, two, two very fine writers in the New Yorker, they write criticism, but you don't find that kind of writing in academic journals in the, uh, the English speaking world. Uh, I hope to have it in PAJ at, when it's at its best, it, criticism like that or arts writing, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it. But in the academic journals, that kind of writing no longer exists. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of literary, literary essay writing doesn't, doesn't really exist because uh, the works uh, move toward uh, um, theory based, um, theory based essays, uh, when they're not artist writings. Mm. Yeah, there is a way one could say um, a tendency in PAJ journals that perhaps also um, still focusing on urgent, urgent, significant, necessary plays, but or works, uh, which should be pointed out, but also you, you, you move to broad themes. I think you write about spirituality, about landscapes, uh, food, uh, drawing, uh, the idea of drawing, like line. Um, um, do you feel um, that is a, a, a tendency towards you go more to, or do you feel it established itself over time, over the five decades you've now published PHA, um, that you are um, focusing on these? larger issues, you know? You talk about Buddha and you talk about uh, Michael Jackson in the same, uh, of course, in the same essay, but um, so um, do you feel that less, less? Over time, in the, in the beginning when the journal was um, first started or when I first started writing, I was interested in, like many people, um, understanding the new theater around us. When I entered the, uh, the, when I came to New York and I looked around and saw new theater, there was a lot, a lot of plays, you know, off off Broadway. Um, there were plays like Fornes and Shepherd, and um, uh, you know, the, you could see some of the Living Theater. You could still see the Performance Group. You could see the uh, uh, the Open Theater. They, you know, there was quite a lot. And then there came along people like Richard Foreman. Um, I began to see his work in, this, in the by the mid seventies or early seventies. Um, Wilson's work, which I first saw in 73, Mabu Mines, which I saw at the same time. And, and, and in that case, I was interested in developing a vocabulary to think about that kind of work. And that resulted in my first book, The Theater of Images. Um, which was a significant and, you know, new contribution, yeah. Well, I, I was trying to uh, you know, think about the, the, the new way of uh, making theater and and performance and text and, and uh, how the performer functioned in that. And that also was reflected in the journal. People were writing essays about, about new theater, about new drama and trying to understand it and define it. After a certain while, the definitions became in a way kind of clear or people understood that. And then people moved on to other topics uh, all throughout the history of the journal. Um, people uh, and I myself moved to other topics by the, you know, by the early 80s. Um, I was, I also turned back to Chekhov and to Pirandello and I wrote very experimental essays on those writers. Um, we were always interested uh, as I was uh, in the journal too, 
of really the whole 20th century. So it was, it was always contemporary work and the historical context. It wasn't just the, last, you know, the work for that year or the last five years. It had to do with seeing things in a much larger context. It could be uh, you know, Dada, it could be a writer from the past or a symbolist writer or maybe a surrealist or something. We were always publishing um, a lot of um, writers. For example, we published uh, some years ago Fernando Prezoa and people didn't know that he also wrote um, plays. Or we published uh, Fassbinder. People didn't knew his films, but they didn't really know that he published plays. Um, it, you know, it was like that. We were always going back and forth. But with the Pirandello essay, for example, um, it was a really experimental essay in the early 80s. And it was um, an essay that I wrote in several sections and then I spread them out on the floor, sp several titled sections, like little paragraphs or a page or something. And I spread it out on the floor and I put it together in some order. Or and the, you worked over a year or something, right? I, I, or, yeah, or I worked a year on for that. One, for one essay, you know, just um, Same thing for my stunning. Same thing essay. I worked a year on that. I had about 90 pages of notes. The one, the, the Gertrude Stein, the introduction to the Stein plays? Um, yes, it's called Presence of Mind. It's in my yeah. college use of theater book. And it was, it, uh, you, it was the introduction to the reprint um, of her last operas and plays. Yeah, it's a fantastic yeah, it's uh, a piece, yeah. Um, but in the 90s. But I worked a year on that also. And I had 90 pages of notes that I had taken from her, re just reading her over and over and over again. So I have tell us a bit, how do you write? What's your process? How do you write? How do you, how do you approach writing an essay? Well, one thing is I don't spend, I don't have a year to spend on an essay now. It's too much time. And um, uh, I moved out of that mode. My process is to read deeply into the work, basically, if I'm writing about an author or about a text, it might mean, in those days, it was reading many of their works, not, not necessarily all of them, but, but many, many of their works and thinking about them. I was always interested in Gertrude Stein's The Play as Landscape. Now my approach is somewhat different. My, my process is, Generally, I like to leave my home and I like to re work in a, in a library with a blank table and another and a neutral space. And um, I, you know, I start with a, with a blank page, but I start when I feel I'm ready to start. And I don't know when that is, except it's kind of an intuitive thing. I take a lot of notes and I take my notes by hand, not in the computer, not typed. They're all handwritten notes. Um, all these decades of writing and they're on loose leaf paper. And um, sometimes the paper, if I know I'm gonna have a lot of notes on a particular topic, that set of notes might be under one thing like say landscape or say text or say music or something like that. And I try to organize the notes that way or if it's not possible, I have, um, I have the, type, the, to the topic of the note in the margin. And then when I feel ready to write, I, I start out at the library and then I'll go with the laptop and maybe, and then start on the computer. I used to write all my work longhand before the computer. I didn't even uh, you know, start in the typewriter. I just wrote longhand and then typed things up. Um, and then I do a lot of rewrites. I do a lot of uh, until I feel it's really right. And then at a certain point, I begin to feel that the essay really wants to live its own life in the world. And then it's, it feels finished. I feel that I can't go over it anymore. And, um, but my work is, uh, is um, much of it is much shorter now. I'm interested in much shorter forms and different types of writing. Um, writing in, in, a, in a different way, um, maybe less about artworks. So I, I don't know, I don't know what direction it will take now after this book, but I'm interested in the, in the kind of, in developing a short form criticism, which I do in the book in that section, writing in the landscape, where I, I base uh, the, the text I'm going to write on perhaps a single photo and try to get a very distilled text of, of 500 words or 1000 words and capture everything in that. And that's what I'm interested in. It, that form allows for a kind of more 
poetic, philosophical, literary um, mm. uh, method. A little and, bit like you, you did on the painting, the Anne Bennett painting, uh, Our Child, you know, that in your, um, we're going to talk about yeah. later, the, the, you know, the writing in the landscape, where you, you start out from an image and, um, mm. and reflect on it. I, for all our listeners, I also, you know, want to remind everybody, it was a, the time you come out, I think you were two young grad students in the 70s, you sat at Cafe Borgia, I think, across from Figaro, both places that don't exist, Blika and McDougall, and you came up, said, we're going to have a journal, and everybody wanted to create a journal, write for a journal. There were many, um, Avalanche, Arterheit, The Fox, Horaces, and um, uh, Soho Weekly News, um, um, something that, in a way, perhaps you know, is missing that spirit to write something for your own as a personal manifesto. Um, I think are, you wrote at the time articles really could have an impact. If Susan Sontag wrote about fascination, about fascism, people would talk about it, right? And it was, people would read it and would go back and forth. And, um, and we experienced that in nostalgia for the 70s, also with Patti Smith's book, you know, on the Just Kids. But um, it was a time that um, uh, really um, invited um, an idea um, of, a, of a criticism. So what is the role, what do you feel? What, what is the role of a critic now? What, what should you, what is the role of, um, of observing the landscape of the well, performance and art? Uh, first of all, <laughs> where is one going to write? You know, uh, so many of the newspapers have disappeared and most publications, the vast majority of publications publish no theater criticism. Um, even the New York Review of Books, for example, I would say they don't even have one piece a year. Um, so national publications don't do much Atlantic or Harper's, places like that. Um, the New York Times has, has criticism or has, you know, most of the stuff is now turned to kind of like a promotional copy or celebrity interviews or stories about how much something costs. So, uh, you know, the New York Observer is, is, is gone, the newspaper, the New York Press, the Soho Weekly News, the Village Voice, all these papers in print that would publish different critics and, um, and um, writings about uh, current art um, have, have closed down. And so you have no downtown papers really and then uh, no national media in a way. It's very difficult to um, have your work written about. You know, there, there, there are blogs in different places that um, occasionally hyperallergic publishes something very rarely, but most places- uh, Brooklyn you know, Rail forum, does. Occasionally our forum does. So the question is, yeah, what is the role of criticism? The people are questioning that, that people have been questioning that since the 60s actually critic's role. Um, most writing about the arts is relegated to academic journals or to journals like uh, PAJ, um, where sometimes, you know, if, if something isn't covered, uh, it totally falls out of the historical archive. So journals have a specific function in terms of uh, being a record of their, of their day, of the work, the way it was thought about. For example, if a play isn't published, it just disappears and often the playwright disappears. So if a production uh, by a company is not written about, you know, it disappears from the historical record um, in a way. So, 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 so journals have an archival function um, that's very important um, in terms of somebody re reacting with the ideas and the culture of the day to, um, you know, to the works that are seen and to let people around the world uh, through these vast uh, data banks that journals exist on to uh, let them know about um, something. So, the, so the, the, the critics role is still um, partly educational, it's partly archival. Also critics write for their own experience of exploring work. Um, and thinking about work uh, in artworks that they are attracted to. In some cases, in, in cases now, people don't generally, or they're, because they're not writing like every, every week, every month or so, they don't have to write on a lot of works they don't really like. But one of the things I've discovered in editing the journal is 
how little people today want to actually write negative, uh, maybe negative is too strong a word, but let's say constructive criticism. People are very loath to um, make any critical comments about a work. They, they, so the work today is often very much an advocacy journalism. Whereas decades ago, it was more critical. People had a more, you know, a definable sense of how art, you know, about artworks and, uh, and certain kinds of standards. So if we're talking about the 70s, let's say, well, that is broken down now. And people are also afraid to um, make negative comments. They're afraid to commit to a certain set of um, values or to, um, because of how, how it might impact them later in terms of grants or jobs or whatever. So that's really difficult to deal with. It's very hard to get people to, to write in an interesting way about productions that they feel have, have, have failed or have not worked very well. Because you so know- you, you, feel, you feel serious criticism, which is an essential part of theater and of its existence as a field, you feel it's missing? Well, yes, because there's hardly any place to publish it, and there are, and nobody can make a living writing criticism. But, but yeah, but there's webs and blogs, and the people can now yes, actually publish are, more than before, you know. But, but um, is it? Um, if you're you talking knew Susan about, Sontag. How tell us a bit about her? What does it mean to have someone like Susan Sontag living around the corner and seeing her in a bookstore and? Uh, and, uh, but, 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 but you first raised the question about all this criticism on the blogs. That's not mm -hmm. archival. That's lost. That's lost the next day. That's really mm -hmm. different from writing serious criticism. But it could be provocative. That's what I mean. Or critical. It could be. You know, uh, um, it could be, yes. Um, uh, but I don't know that it, it is in terms of theater, maybe in visual arts or something. I, you know. It, it really depends. Um, yeah, you, know, you asked about Susan Sontag. Well, she she was you know a big figure in the in the seventies. I think in the nineteen seventies she was probably in middle age in her forties. Um, I'm trying to recall, uh, but she was a fixture around a lot. She would go to a lot of um, theaters and bookshops and be seen. Um, you know, all the time. And I remember many. It was a kind of a joke too because so many people wanted quotes from her on their books and you know so she and also people wanted her to come and see their work they wanted to know what Susan Sontag thought about it and her her works are you know they're still taught today and they're very exciting and provocative and so many things that she wrote about um you, you know she was prophetic uh about um you know, about certain kinds of issues or things that she wrote about early when people didn't really understand pop culture all that much in the early 60s. You know, her thinking of her essays on camp or against interpretation. She she was always interested in, in, in criticism as a form, though she then would later say that she's not a critic. She said, oh, I'm not a critic. I, I um, write, a, I Attach my ideas to works that I admire. I think she may have said that in the, mm -hmm. the interview that we published with her in the late 70s. But she was always very supportive of PAJ. I remember we went to interview her in the late 70s, just about two years after PAJ was, um, was published, uh, was founded. Um, and she had just come home from a chemotherapy treatment. She was told in her 40s that she was going to die from cancer it eventually killed her if she had so much radiation but she lived more decades but she had just come home from a, a, a chemo treatment and we went over to her apartment she lived on the next block actually up on the upper west side um and we lived up there gals and Descripta and i and um we did this interview and and it's really fun to hear it on on tape you know she was she was so nice to us and so supportive another time i remember when we were living on St. Mark's Place, she came for a meeting that we were going to have there and she had flown home in a snowstorm and she still came to the apartment. And um, she was very kind of romantic about writing in Bohemia and um, editing and all that. She thought that that's what people should do, you know, ha have independent publications. And she was always right. very supportive of, 
of a, of a kind of downtown culture and um, and avant-garde work and uh, and 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 people whose you know, whose work that she respected, let's say. And I asked her in the early '80s to um, to uh, write the preface to the uh, Marie Irene Fournes volume of plays. I asked her to do that for PAJ, and I remember very vividly her coming to the office to deliver it <laughs> around yeah. 1981 or two or something. You know. Yeah, I mean, it is it's really incredible. The, I think the contribution to the field of for TDR, yours or the theater magazine. Um, um, but Bonnie, how did you, how did you get to writing? As far as I know, you grew up in Jersey, you're an Italian uh, American family. H how, how, what, when did you know, what was the moment or when did that happen? And um, that you said, I would like to be a writer. What was that? I don't know if I ever said that to myself that I would like to be a writer. I don't know if I knew what I would do. I. I do know that when I was in college, um, I began to be interested in the arts. Um, and I, by at least my junior year, I entered college as a Latin major and planned to be a Latin teacher of all things. Then I switched to the English department. And with a friend and I, we used to come into New York. Uh, at that time, there were seven o'clock shows and 10 o'clock shows, you know, off of Broadway, like in, around the East Village. Or, or off Broadway. And um, we used to come to both shows. Maybe I'd come back Sunday for a matinee. I went to school in Jersey. It was very close to um, New York City. It was easy to get back and forth by bus or car. And, um, and then at that time, I started the drama and arts page of my college paper um, in the late 60s. And then I began to be a critic. I never thought of being an artist, to be honest. I never thought of, it never occurred to me to do anything else like to direct or write plays or anything. I always wanted to write about the arts, but I was interested in many different kinds of arts. I, I went to the ballet and, as well as modern dance. I went to Broadway. I saw many of the great musicals um, of that era, like the like Follies and Company and Bame and, and Hello Dolly and all that stuff and Sweet Charity, many different things. I went to uh, the opera sometimes or to classical music. I, I was always interested in, in, in all of the arts. Um, and, and at that time I would see stuff at La Mama and you know, in the East Village. Um, Tom, uh, I think I saw Futz or one of Tom Paine's uh, pieces and Rochelle Owens. And, 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 and I also um, saw you know, the Pinter, the, um, the birthday party the, the uh, Pinter play on Broadway. So I wasn't distinguishing between works. I was seeing all, all what I considered serious works or worth, uh, works that I wanted to see. And I began to write. I wrote about the living theater that I saw, but I also wrote about Judy Garland. I wrote about plays, uh, I wrote about books. When I, I then became a music critic and um, I wrote a lot. I interviewed um, artists. Uh, I wrote about jazz, early jazz. I remember I reviewed that big uh, set of uh, Bessie Smith records when Columbia published them and they came out. I interviewed Cleo Lane when she first came to New York and came known to, known to audiences. I wrote for things like Downbeat and Crawdaddy and Rolling Stone. I wrote about pop singers like at that time, Dolly Previn or Melissa Manchester. I remember trying to get a, a, a magazine to let me write about Philip Glass, but they felt he was too far out. So while I was doing all this other work, I was also seeing Philip Glass concerts at the Idea Warehouse um, in the 70s in, in uh, Tribeca. You so, still claim he did some PAJ plumbing right in the office. Uh, no, no, not PAJ. Not yet, you would not. Some, no, some people, no, so many. No, not no, for us. <laughs> not for you, not for yeah. others. Incredible but, time to think of, yeah. Yeah, so if, if people were widely available and around, around the streets, around different clubs and cafes and bookshops and everything and reading similar publications and everything was more centralized then. But I never um, really thought, oh, I'm going to be a writer and, and really focus on that. I then eventually went to graduate school in the early 70s, but I was also writing... Um, essays for other kinds of journals like the Michigan Quarterly Review or the Kenyon Review or something. I would write maybe drama pieces. I eventually got out of the music reviewing and um, 
then got, once I started graduate school at CUNY, got exclusively into writing about theater. And then I, just by extraordinary luck, I got that book contract just as I was finishing graduate school for the Theater of Images. Um, in fact, I gave that idea for a book like that to a publisher who I'd become friendly with. And I even told him who should do it. And he said to me, why don't you do it? And, mm -hmm. and that's what I did. I, and I got that contract and that kind of you know, solidified a place and gave me you know, confidence and respect doing that mm -hmm. book. And then I you know, yeah. and started the journal. And so everything kind of went that way. I, I don't have a life plan. Like I didn't have think, what I, where I wanted to be in five years or 10 years or this or that, but I was always writing. In graduate school in those days, you didn't have to go to conferences. You didn't have to teach. You could go to the theater four or five nights a week, which I was doing and also writing about it for the Soho Weekly News. And um, it was much more free as a, even as a graduate student to, to, to develop and see what you want. So I just, mm -hmm. you know, got it. Much less regulated. And uh, maybe we talk later on, you know, we you know, your ideas um, about, you know, PhD programs. Yeah, I like that line that this guy said to you, why don't you do it? Um, <laughs> yes. which, is a, which is a great motto to think about, you know, and um, why don't you do it? And, why, and also a call yeah. for everybody to engage, to write, to draw, and draw, you know, to engage, I think. And perhaps it is something that um, um, generations afterwards did a bit less and consumed a bit more and did a little bit less, do it yourself. And, um, mm -hmm. and so um, I think that spirit of the time, also the encouragement to, to do it yourself is something that um, I think is, is so, so important to our mentors who do it. But let's talk a bit about uh, also the book. I mean, I'm gonna read through some names um, on the essays. You know, um, you, it's uh, 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 Meredith Monk, Raymond Hoger, Alvis Romanes, uh, Janina Carabunario from Romania, Laurie Anderson, Caroline Schneeman, Dick Higgins, John Jonas, John Jastrom, Abramovich, Herbert Blau, Sam Shepard, and then essays, introduction. So it's a whole um, uh, uh, kaleidoscope in a way and a whole offering uh, of a Thanksgiving table um, 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 to look at. And what I liked about it is on one way, we know about Meredith Monk very well in a way, but still you got to know something in that long interview, which we didn't know. And then there was someone like the Raymond Hoge, the dramaturg, uh, uh, who started out actually as a writer about theater and dance for Pina Bausch. And with him, I would like to talk a little bit about the Raymond Hoge um, um, interview. And uh, I felt it was in a way a real discovery. We didn't know so much about it. How did you connect to him? Why did you chose him? How did that all happen? I met him the first time he came to New York to perform. I must have been intrigued by reading uh, maybe a preliminary piece or something or I found out about him maybe in another newspaper. I didn't know him and he came to New York and I decided that I would interview him. Tell a little bit about him. So I know you ask him in the interview, who are you? And, and he came out and he said, and you actually said, yeah, I want to know who you are because no one knows about you. So uh, who, who was he? Yeah. Uh, Raymon Hogue, um, unfortunately he died in the, in May, it, it was about yeah, 72, year. 72 years old. He'd been Pina Bausch's dramaturg for 10 years. Um, in the very early years, I think he helped her choose a lot of the music um, and uh, work on the different pieces with her. He was very close with her. Uh, he felt very bad actually about her, her death. She had already died by the time I interviewed um, Hogue. Uh, what, what year was that that I that I interviewed him? I, I don't I don't even uh, remember um, in the in the nineties it might have been. Um, let's see what year did I interview him in? Well, if you don't know, I don't. New York know. in two thousand nine. He came to New York in two thousand nine. Mm -hmm. So. I remember we went to some noisy restaurant in Midtown. It was so hard to hear him and everything on the tape. But I just started from the very <clears> beginning. I, I didn't mean it so literally when I said, who are you? <laughs> you know, but I started off that way and he told me about yeah. his work. The thing about Raymond Ho, he described himself as a hunchback. 
he had a very um, challenged uh, body and, um, and, and he was on the stage. So we had difficulties with some audiences, particularly in Germany. We talked a lot about the body and dancing. He also did, did he was also um, very, in, you know, in, enthralled of uh, certain singers. We discovered that we both had a love of singers. We talked about Peggy Lee. We talked about Maria Callas. Mm -hmm. He talked mm -hmm. about various um, versions of operas that he was in, of, of uh, dance pieces or music pieces that he was interested in, like Swan Lake or The Rite of Spring or Bolero. He was he yeah. had great passion and love um, of, uh, of of art, and he, he spoke in a very honest, uh, poetic way uh, about uh, about work and about um, these kinds of works that he loved. As a matter of fact, I, I'd gotten a few notes from different people in the in the arts who wrote me about my book, and it's interesting that both of them. Um, that I can recall, pointed to that um, interview as being a very uh, inspiring. Um, who wrote you uh, on the article? Well, I don't want to say who wrote you. Yes. Uh, mm. But anyway, he, um, both of them were very... Both yeah, it's, it's something that is surprising. First, the idea, I mean, we had heard about of a dramaturg, but a dramaturg for dance. Um, you know, it's sold normally in such literary history, if at all, and that even isn't fully accepted in North America. Um, and um, but the idea that he was a, a dramaturg for the Tanz Theater and Pina Bausch never worked with one before or after him. Um, so that idea that someone guides to mu music, of course, a lot, but also he really, um, I think, looked uh, in a way at her work. And that is a stunning thing. And I think there are now also, you know, serious at Yale, you know, um, um, you know, on where you now study uh, dance um, dramaturgy, you know, That's where dramaturgy. you could. Yeah, uh, he established uh, in a way, if you, but yet we haven't really heard about him. I mean, I thought the interview was so beautiful when he talked about the hands of performers, the energy of the hands. Um, when um, he talked about uh, uh, beauty and ugliness and it all ultimately is about beauty, but he says, society says Arnold Schwarzenegger, he says it's a beautiful body and I am a freak, I am ugly, but it's not true. He said, well, you know, you know mm -hmm. Ryman Hoag, um, uh, there was a, doc, a German documentary of his life, and he also was a well-known cultural journalist. Yeah, and he, was he wrote for the Zeit movie. magazine. Yeah, it's a very significant. Yeah, he speaks like about Pasolini. There's one thing I want, there's one beautiful thing um, that he says. I want to just re read you what yeah. he called it to me. He said, um, and I. this is the end of our interview. Um, when I started out, and I'm quoting Raimund here, when I started out, what I said was, with my body, which is not called beautiful, I can go very far in looking for beauty. If I would have a body like Barishnikov, then it would be much more difficult. But with me, you have this break, this distance, these two things. You have what you accept as beauty, the music, and you have the body that doesn't fit what you think. It's like a landscape. You cannot only say the sea is beautiful. We shouldn't have hills anymore. There should be both. And my body is more like a hill maybe. I, you know, I, I just think he has such a beautiful yeah. sentiment and the way he thought about things and spoke. So we had a very nice interview. Then I saw him a couple of years later in Spain and I, I had a few more questions and I eventually uh, published that um, interview with him. I find that I like uh, conversations with artists um, more and more. Um, mm. you know, yeah, they, and he also, he talked about the emotion that audiences are afraid, you know, now of emotions and- um, Yeah, and beauty, he talks and about beauty, that. and he says actually, you know, that is poetry is the ultimate form. And um, so I, I thought it was very, made me think of so many things, I liked it. Um, you also talk about John Jesseron in the book, someone who in a way is known and also not known at all, um, who such a hard time to get produced, mostly is forced to do it on its own, but yet um, I think you said um, he uh, uh, created a new contemporary theater um, language, his deep sleep, snow, Faust, to lock it is of course the Chang series, Shadow and Massacre, Fire. You talk about Firefall also, I think 2009 a lot. 
tell me a bit, why did you choose John Jesseron? Why of that big, you know, there are so many also, there's Maxwell and there is a, uh, the Wooster Group, there's, uh, um, there is Mac Wellm, and I mean, so many also great artists, Big Dance and, uh, and uh, Elevator, but you, you talk about him. So t tell me a little bit why you feel he needed to be in there. Well, you mentioned all these other people, but the question was what was there in 2010 when I wrote that article, when yeah, I published yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Why um, was it more important than others? What did you, what, what did you see in that? I don't, I don't know. I, I, one of the things I regret is that I don't have something on Richard Maxwell in this book. I, I've always wanted to write on Richard Maxwell, and I just couldn't mm -hmm. keep holding up the book um, and being able to do, uh, you know, take on another writer because it would take months, uh, mm -hmm. months to yeah. read over the plays again and look at videos and all of that. Um, I, I was interested in a particular reason. It's not. It's very difficult to write and to write um, and to write about artworks. You, you have to really, you know, somehow live in that landscape or or have some ideas about it. I'm not interested. I I have so little time actually not enough time to write the things I want to or, um, or to explore new areas. Um, so uh, what really attracts me is, you know, something that I, I have ideas that I can work with in the piece or that the piece suggests new ways of looking. Um, in particular, that work, Firefall, was the subject of that um, essay. But the larger theme was the concept of mediaturgy. Um, yeah, yeah. This term was you, 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 you kind of coined, and uh, I think Miss Marion Weems uh, in a talk. Uh, earlier, I, we were talking about that in an er, er, earlier essay a couple of years before that. People now talk about media and dramaturgy and things like this, but this concept, you know, was already 12, 13, 14 years old. Basically, I was talking about it as, as, as a uh, mediaturgy in John Jesseron's work, which was done in this very complicated way with uh, people sitting at uh, tables with um, their computers in front of them and communicating that way and also communicating with, um, you, you know, um, uh, on the screen and in this great, you know, technological kind of experiment. And I was talking about mediaturgy in terms of the way that media is embedded in the narrative. It's the architecture of it. I was talking about the concept of performance as design. So I had a lot of things to say at that time about this particular work. Um, now, now we've moved beyond that um, in the sense of some of the vocabulary and terminology that I use about erasing and deleting and things like that. But it was a very complicated piece that, that, yeah. that John, uh, had developed uh, at that time, and maybe it didn't get a lot of attention, and maybe his work doesn't get enough attention um, you know, in these media histories that are being written uh, and these media overviews. Um, but that was a very specific uh, idea about performance as design and um, as, a, as a new way of thinking about uh, performance and, and actually through you know, work that takes place totally on a computer. I think what's mm -hmm. happened in, in uh, a lot of um, scholarship is that it, um, a lot of young scholars, I have to say, um, are showing that their historical methodology is kind of weak. I think they believe this to be true in theater, and I've talked about it with uh, many people. There just isn't a kind of preservation of the theater legacy as you find in dance or in visual arts. And I think that people are too focused on what they're reading now who's in and who's out and uh, what um, uh, the current books and conferences are. And I feel that people don't know foundational texts or enough about uh, even the very, very recent past or even a couple of decades. And it's showing up in the kinds of essay submissions we even get from theater, the lack of historical knowledge and um, documentation. And I feel this is a problem for theater that it's too focused on the contemporary. Mm. So, I think it was yeah interesting that in, in the Jesseron piece where you said that one way say it's open source material, he collages, you know, out of the vast uh, mm -hmm. uh, ocean of internet news. 
um, as a world digital archive. But then you said it's a little bit like the 1930s living newspaper. You know, it's kind of a, a beautiful um, um, connection um, you made there. You, and you talked about the homo media. You know, I, I like that the idea of, uh, um, of the homo uh, media. When how, how do human beings exist linguistically, visually, spatially, and digitally in our global age? I mean, these are questions and artists are negotiating it. So I thought that um, your, 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 your uh, approach to something that also seemed a bit foreign, you know, you had to write about screens and projections and it's actually a little bit away from, uh, from Beckett and Pirandello and uh, what you normally is, but you, you engaged, I think, uh, with the material and um, in a work that perhaps, no, not perhaps, it would be, you know, not in recorded. And now um, um, in a way it um, will be there. When we ask you to share a chapter, um, 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 you said, uh, um, but maybe, yeah, you said, uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's use a writing in the landscape. Why did you, why, what do you mean by that? And why did you choose that out of the book? Well, um, uh, the writing in the landscape section, there are four or five or six sections in the book. Um, it's the last one. <laughs> and all our readers, by the way, you could go to the email. Uh, you got the invitation. You click on it. You can have it in our Google Drive. It's up. It's down there. Yeah. Um, this this section follows uh, an interest I've had for a long time. Actually, if you even go back to what I was talking about with the theater of images, I've honestly always had an interest in text and image. Um, and uh, by the by the 80s, I was I also wrote a few pieces which were taking a photograph and writing <clears throat> caption like or longer sections based on that image. And then and I've done that periodically um, in the in these years of writing, these decades of writing. Um, but in recent years, I've been working specifically on um, uh, on a kind of short form criticism. And as I described it, um, all these pieces have to do with a, a single artwork or an image um, uh, of that artwork, <clears throat> and mostly outdoors. And that's why it's writing in the landscape, mostly outdoors, and in which I use this piece to, to have a more dreamy, poetic, uh, literary uh, and maybe philosophical representation, but also, um, and, and again, I didn't put all this together like from the very beginning of the book, which is called Timelines, but I had been realizing that over the, the last decade or maybe five or seven years, um, I had been introducing the element of time in my art, my writing. Uh, where I am or what I'm doing. Um, and I and, and it's just been coming out that way in a sense. So this short form criticism also allows me to do that. And I do it also in the preface of the book. I like the idea of introducing the element of time. And mm -hmm. uh, in my work, I've always tried to base on the voice. Uh, that you can speak the work. I know some years ago, I don't remember when, I'd have to go back and check it. I, I like the idea of writing as almost a form of prayer, which is to say a kind of a different rhetorical style from the way we speak uh, or from the way we write in a more formal way. I, I like different rhetorical styles in writing. So I, I play with this as well, but timelines, but I mean, uh, the writing the landscape uh, there are five or six or seven pieces in that section, and they all uh, they all have to do with the outdoors. So um, you mentioned the piece, uh, you mentioned the Amy Bennett painting and mm -hmm. the piece Our Towns. Tell that, us a little bit, yeah, about it. Well, that was, had to do with a painting I saw in a gallery in which this artist, this visual artist, um, stay, create, painted a scene of our town that was being staged outdoors in, the, in a kind of mountainous landscape. And the strange thing about it is that there were armed guards at all of the 
um, all of the parts of the tent in which the, the last scene of the play took place. And the tent and is kind of a kind of evangelical, uh, you know, white, a big uh, uh, outdoor tent, you know, like, uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, that you would see in the summer, summer festivals. But I use that and I put that together with the um, shooting at one of these outdoor festivals in California, this garlic festival. So that's why it's called Our Towns 2019. It has to do with a certain kind of violence in our town and these simple small town life and fairs where this violence, um, you know, hangs, hangs, who knows where, whether it will erupt or not. Um, another piece I wrote for um, a book that Daniel Sack had edited called um, Imagine Theaters. And it was mm -hmm. about just sitting in my backyard in the Hudson Valley and um, writing a description of what, writing a, just a list or a description of what was happening at that time with trees and birds and sound. And I was actually uh, doing that in the context of writing about how I was always interested in Gertrude Stein's concept, the play as landscape. <clears throat> so I was looking at the landscape in that sense. So that's what I've done there. Another yeah. one was about um, <clears throat> the trees at Watermill. Mm. Robert. Villa, yeah, Villa uh, Panza also, you know, in, uh, yeah. in Italy, right? Wilson's inside. Which wasn't that inside the video installation? The uh, one of the one, one part was the owls. The owls, yeah. In, inside mm. at the Villa Panza in the Varese, Italy. But the uh, other a uh, house that he created, a permanent structure, it was outside and it had it's a permanent installation and it had a tape recording of his voice reading Rilke. In reading it. Rilke, letters to a young, to a, um, 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 to a young um, um, artist. Um, yeah, yeah. I, feel, I felt they're very, yeah, as you said, they're very personal, they are poetic, intimate, uh, observational in the moment, a little bit zen-like and also touching on you know, on one, some a very specific artwork as you did in your early PhD writing, but then also in kind of, you know, what you now also tend to reflect about like mysticism and spiritualism, Buddhism, religion, instead, you know, which is noticeable instead of saying what now also is at the forefront, uh, which is gender um, or um, a race and, um, and all that. So it's a different, it falls out on the, of the current um, chorus. Um, um, of voices. Someone said poetry is uh, to a novel what, like jumping is to a marathon, you know, and uh, like we jump up in the air and poetry is, is that. And I felt these pieces in a way are also your jumps and we hear your voice even more clear and less the service, the great service uh, to the field you have done as a worker in the vineyard, you know, of theater to keep that, you know, we out have, foster these plants, cut this away, put that in um, as an editor, um, where you say very clearly also, I'm not a curator, by the way, why did you say that? I'm an editor, I'm not a curator, what? Oh yeah, I think that um, people tend to now refer to the artistic directors refer to themselves as curators or editors as curators. I think it's just kind of funny. It's just absorbing the language of visual arts because it sounds cool to be a curator. Yeah. But I, I'm very proud to be an editor um, and to connect to the you know, long, long uh, history of editors and, um, and publishing. I, and that's the tradition I belong to. What does it mean if I said I'm a curator? I, I don't have to say that I'm a cu I curate the issues. That just sounds kind of pretentious to me. Um, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, and so all I, of our, so of our <laughs> great important texts, so many from the Old Testament yeah. to the New, they were all edited of different sources from different people. People had to make up their minds. Um, before we close, a little bit about also the, the chapter, which I thought is interesting on performance drawings. It's an interest of you. I, um, you know, when you say, uh, when is a personal line? What does a line mean? Uh, can a person be a pencil year old is drawing his thought? Can it uh, drawing, does the arm follow the thought? Is the thought comes first and the arm um, follows? And, um, and so you interview um, artists about their practice of drawing and performance. And you mm -hmm. question whether the rhythm of the drawing 
can be found in the actual artwork. Why are you so fascinated? Because it seems to such a contradiction. On one hand, you say, we are a literary journal. We are not performance art. Uh, our models is Farage, Strauss, and the publishing houses. But here you look at drawings of lines of charcoal on a paper, and you look for answers. Why? Well, I became interested in um, performance and drawing about 12 years ago, and I started a section in PAJ. And since that time, we've published a lot of um, artists who have drawing as part of their um, making of a performance. Um, you know, as a writer, I could, I'm interested in a lot of things. I've written about food. I've written about um, That's novella, yeah. garden, you know, garden literature. Garden book, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm interested in, in as much as I have time for. But still, your garden literature is not connected to a performance. There are ideas with poem, like John Jonah's interview, for example, where you ask mm. very clearly, what, what does it mean? Uh, yeah, but each name and also when you speak to them, you say, you know, where's wh wh the intersection? What, mm -hmm. what, what did you learn? Enough, Why is it of interest? Interestingly enough, there's now um, a, a move toward a kind of thinking about um, performance and writing about performance as a kind of garden theater also. That's a, that's a new line in performance studies. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but I'm, I found that just in, in my research or knowing about artists or reading about them that a lot that a lot of them draw they draw before the performance or some in some cases like Joan Jonas they draw in a performance um, they uh, make studies or they or perhaps afterwards there, a lot of dancers of course do that but it, it's different than notation Trisha Brown is the outstanding example and we just published some a piece about her drawings um, even Richard Foreman, there's the little tiny, yeah, you know, Richard boxes. Right? Is Wilson, of course, yeah, is so yeah. famous for that, yeah. Wilson was the first portfolio we published. We published his drawings for um, uh, Three Penny Opera in 2008. The essay you referred to um, about performance drawing is what I was, I was asked to write the preface to a book that just came out in England on performance and drawing as, the, as uh, and new art practices. Um, since 1945. It's just that um, it's something that's been there um, beneath the surface and yet there's really virtually nothing written on performance and drawing in the, in the in theater scholarship. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm very interested in drawing, works on paper. I like, I like that very much. And um, it's, it was something new to write about that I hadn't written about before. That's how I came to that topic. And um, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm interested in introducing new topics in PAJ. I'm interested in new directions in my, in my own work. And- um, Do you draw? So, do you make drawings? No, I don't. I don't draw, I don't do any visual art at all. Um, but I'm very interested, I mean, I love visual arts. And- mm, I know uh, you published a book on Etel Adnan who unfortunately just died, the great Lebanese. Yeah. A writer, also theater writer, writer for the theater. She worked with Wilson also early on, but also a great painter and drawings. It's just, I think it's still up at the Guggenheim with the, with the um, yes, Kandinsky. And you, you, you did that book, right, on her. We published a book called The Sun on the Tongue. Once I was introduced to her work, I loved her work right away. And I mean, she was one of the great artists of our time. She died at, at 96. Um, I have for some of her drawings, you know, which are, which are beautiful. Um, well, she, she made tapestries, she made films, um, she wrote essays she, in the book. There's a wonderful essay on Pina Bausch that she had written. She wrote on philosophy. Um, um, I have many, many of her books. She was a great poet and thinker born, yeah. in, um, born in, uh, in Lebanon. And so she had the wisdom of several continents, Europe, and um, the Middle East and, and the US where she lived in California for several decades. So, um, you know, uh, she, she had, like many great artists, I mean, she had worked in so many different mediums and, and she, had, she had a great uh, world wisdom and she was painting up until the time she died. She, her paintings are on an exhibit. She She's died last week. Yeah, you know. She died so, last um, 14th yeah. of November. 
Yeah. yeah. And she was painting. She, she, she sat at her desk and painted with a very thick palette. Um, she wasn't writing in recent years, but she just had a book out last mm -hmm. year. Um, <clears throat> Shifting yeah. the Silence. Shifting the Silence. Like, journey in, Towards Death. Yeah, what she yeah. wrote about. I'm, I'm interested yeah. very much in, in, in writers and um, increasingly in poet and poets and poets theater. Um, yeah, and, no, it's uh, a really, um, really great also that you share that, your thoughts, that you encourage people to write and also why don't you do it? Also to, you know, performance makers, why not making drawings and think, find out something that might be something um, in there. It's quite, um, I think, um, um, also always, I feel the spirit of it is optimistic, it's hopeful, it makes you think, it asks you to question them something again. And there's some um, some openness um, about it. It's always so well written. Your work also, your sentences are so clear. I think Schechner once said he, he could see right away that you studied Latin um, uh, when he saw your um, um, your writing, and of course Richard also hit that son, such a tremendous and fantastic and brilliant work, and you yeah. and 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 so many others, it's a real great legacy of a generation that really cared about question and put in hard hard work to publish also other voices, not just their own, and. Um, I feel that is um, and truly um, exceptional. And the Etel Adnan book, because she just had, it is a great PAJ book that really deserves, uh, I think also it deserves a big edition with lots of photos and a big a hardcover for a coffee table book, but you had to publish it in a small, beautiful one, but you know what, it fits in your pocket. And I do it, you can take it with you and it's something um, um, to be, um, to be said for that, as a last question, I think I will ask you to read maybe maybe something from the watermelon, uh, the tree, uh, about the tree lines. I would like to hear about it. But a uh, last question, I think you, in one of your editorials, when you write about uh, uh, the process of the editing, you said one of the questions is what remains to be done? So uh, my question to you also is what remains to be done? What's, uh, I know you work on the book on Dick Higgins, who you also talk about that so close to Fluxes um, it is and his, Graphics, you know, all that the, we didn't talk about it, the instructional plays. And he was so upset that actors in a traditional theater follow a script that someone else wrote. And how can human beings just be so stupid and follow something someone else wrote? So it questioned everything, which I did like. But what's up for you? What remains to be done? You know, you, you just covered so many topics. I just want to go back for a second yeah. to say that, um, yeah, I've always considered Foreman's work, I mean, uh, uh, Schechner's work, so provocative of that generation of her Blau yeah. and Brustein and those people. And I, I, it's unfortunate that artists don't write more. I love to publish artist writings um, and their drawings show so much insight. For example, Annie B. Parson, we published yeah. um, some of her drawings and her particular charts where she, where she um, draws the props that she uses over and over or how they're used in a particular piece. So drawing illuminates um, a lot about performance, performance thinking, what I call performance mm -hmm. thinking. Um, but artist writings are really in short supply now. You know, Richard, people should contact you. You're open for submission for articles, everything. You're open for business. Uh, yeah. Well, the thing is that, uh, you know, the recent books are by uh, uh, Lee Brewer. He wrote, um, he wrote uh, uh, some of the recent Late Lee Brewer. Yeah, we did his last there interview, are, actually. There are, ever. A volume of artists writing. Schechner wrote so much about the works that he directed. He wrote provocative ideas. Even if I don't agree with him, it's fine. He's in the, he's in the world and it's something to think and talk about. And I've always valued that. People used to argue and fight over ideas and disagree. We don't have to agree on everything and be nice and have consensus, you know? So I just want to say that I admire that from that generation. It's a real loss that we don't have more yeah. directors yeah. and playwrights writing about their work. Everything is now interviews or something like that, you know? Yeah, but, press um, material that gets reworked. And, yeah. uh, so you asked the, what's to be yeah, done. I, what I, remains I, to be done? I yeah. think uh, more and more artists writing, so of course, um, <clears throat> I like to pursue more in the performance and drawing. Um, I'd like to see people, um, and I personally like to, continue to experiment in new critical forms. Uh, are you talking about the, you know, the field in general or 
as an editor. Yeah. For you, your life as an editor in general, yeah. What I'm working on now is a, a volume of, um, of Dick Higgins' work because uh, people have known him as Fluxus, uh, as a Fluxus member and founder, but they don't know what a great theater man he was. And I think that there's more than 250 performance scores that he called graphis drawings or recipes or maps or photo music are really completely unknown um, to see with people. So I hope that uh, when this book comes out next year, um, that um, it might give new impetus for people to again experiment in uh, in in writing for the theater in in, in uh, or writing for performance, whether it's in performance scores or plays or different kinds of text or also drawing, because many of these drawings were performed as a performance score. They performed it's instructional all over the world. performance scores in a way. Yeah, they were yeah, performance yeah. scores, and so. Um, I'm, With, I'm, uh, you know, vacuum cleaners and blow dryers and vocalizations. Right. Page yeah. idea of sound, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think. And but some of, them, some of them were, draw they were drawings. And so sometimes they were placed on the floor as a map, actually. Yeah, and I performers were, were in yeah. them. I, I think people should be more free and, and more uh, experimental. But I, I realize that there's so many factors that are so difficult with the corporate boards and finding an audience today and the politics and everything. I, I wish that people would be less conformist and more free and imaginative in their thinking and really think about what where the theater is going and where what. is it going yeah yeah, yeah i mean we are coming closer yeah. you know to an end i we didn't go to but i also liked your line where you said you know real world action you know is now also sublimated by articles or essays you know which you said often exaggerate the subversive cultural impact of us so we write about critical what people did and artists but a real world action about climate change, uh, hunger of children in America, I mean, it's supposed to be up to 30% experience what the Americans call food insecurity, which means hunger. It's unimaginable, you know, the uh, people in, uh, in jails and whatever that, 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 you know, the question, what the engagement with the real world or what Sartre said, how can we talk about art? Look at the child that's starving, you know, what, what, so I think there's also something more to explore, but Bonnie, at the very end, I would like you um, to read, I think, you, which I like very much. Of course, we do all do uh, admire Bob Wilson and his great watermill center in the tree. So I, and I think it's also in the book, it's a very special essay, a very special poem in a way, long form poem, what you wrote. And maybe read us a little bit and, um, and uh, as a goodbye. So we also hear your voice. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, th th this piece you wanted me to read is Tree Lines. It was written for Bob's 70th birthday, there was a, a book um, published in Germany and I was asked to write an essay in it. So that was um, 10 years ago actually, because now he just turned 80. Um, and it was also a celebration of Watermill. I think Watermill 20th year anniversary. This is his laboratory and art center in uh, Watermill, <clears throat> New York in Long Island. So this piece is called Tree Lines. <clears throat> This is a section from it. Um, at Watermill, the grounds act as a kind of book of nature, its pages bounded by vistas of garden, field, and path. There I walked round and round, stepping on crushed stones and down terrace stairs, flanked by billowy grasses gathered up for the winter like rows of fertility goddesses. Through the joint of the building, its meditative heart I saw distant trees framed in open passageways, their tangled branches, so many slender drawings in the open air. Trees are outside and they are inside, inside out. In this theater of illusion, they live among the furniture, visible through the glass doors. The sight of trees beyond bookend, bookend a long corridor of interior rooms calmed by the solitude of sculpture. Whenever I looked through a window, trees were framed in the reflection of its glass panes. Gertrude Stein would probably have said it was windowful, to use one of her capacious words. Wandering along pathways in the woods, I found myself in the company of spirit guides in the shape of large steels clustered in discrete sites, as if they were other populations gathered into the artistic life of the watermill community. 
a group facing this way and that seemed to be conversing. Others, tall and proud, conjure a different species of wisdom in the forgotten signs carved onto their wooden chests. Here and there are the sacred coffin lids of ancient cultures and continents, a poem to the cycle of time. Even a spiritual ladder has its own setting. Bob the traveler, Bob the lover of lost civilizations, he places well-worn totems far from faraway islands by Long Island walkways, designing sight lines for strollers. Footsteps on stones and leaves and soil tell time in organic matter. Everything matters. A forest of myth, a place of dreams, and over there a stage. How the landscape makes a play. That's part of it. Fantastic. Yeah, it's a beautiful image. And I like that word window full from in a way we say, which also I think is what PAJ does. It really does open windows. Um, Venetians say when the door closes, sometimes windows open. And I think um, lots of doors at the moment seem to be closing, but also doors are opening and some of them are opened by you. The things between heaven and earth, what the band doors supposedly is named after by T.S. Eliot, his poem. So I'm um, really, Bonnie, uh, thank you for your window for work, for your great contribution to New York theater as an archivist, uh, you know, where you say so many focus on theory now, what, but what about the artists? What about the places? What about the theaters? What about the productions? Hope, you know, it's a little bit, we have a little bit less on it. It's a little bit out of balance before maybe there was not enough theory. And it's also a call, you know, to, to, um, to, to re-engage. And uh, as your friend said, why don't you do it? And if Bonnie could do it as a young student, you can do it, whoever is listening. So please um, do engage. Thank you again in our highest uh, uh, respect and uh, congratulation on your great work of 50 years publishing a journal. So many we heard close, you stayed open. It looks easy. It's so much work, uh, what, you, what you did. Uh, as a mother courage, as I said, pushing the PAJ wagon, you know, through, <laughs> through our times. And um, so thank you for spending some time with us. People don't go out and look at the book and dream up your own book, uh, what you would put in there and what you, what it might be something very meaningful inside there for you. And the audience says, thank you for taking the time to listen to us. I know so much is out there now and so much more content. When we started the Siegel Talks, it was very little. Um, at the time now, I think it is one of the forms of engagement we do have, So, but we really value it and it means a lot that you uh, join us. Uh, thanks to the great HowlRound Thea VJ for making this possible. My team, Andy um, uh, and uh, um, Tanvi and Cactus Juice, it's uh, Gorav, it's uh, really important to have you um, all with us. and. Um, and it makes a big difference. And join us with Teresa Smalek on November 29 after Thanksgiving. We have a little bit of time talking about Ron Water, a very important, significant New York artist who unfortunately died too early. And if Marion Weems and also John Jesson, both names came up today, they will be uh, with us and talk about uh, him and his work. So Bonnie, thank you again. And I hope to uh, see you very soon. Very enjoyable. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, and it's so great how you can you also mix an urban life in New York with kind of a rural country setting and that both places are of real importance to you. And it also reflects, I think, um, in your work. So goodbye. Thank you. And all stay safe. And uh, till the next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.